Okay, everyone. Welcome to lecture eight of CS two thirty five Applied Robot Design for Non Robot Designers. Just real quick, I sent out Lab two last night. You got two emails: one incorrect, the second corrected. So uh, basically, um, click on the link from the second email. It's also posted on the Lab two section of the course website. If you have any questions about it, let's save that until after class. We've got a lot to get through t today. So we're going to start by finishing up something I forgot to mention about cables, which um, I think some of you tried to get me to finish up, and I just didn't have time. So remember, um, that looks bad. Remember uh, how we were talking about cable drives? This technical moment brought to you by Sony. Sony, make or find technical moments. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing. It's, that's amazing. Someone tell me what these little beads are. Did I tell you how to do them? No. That would probably be useful information seeing as Lab 3 involves you doing cable terminations. Let's start out with this though. So. Uh, I'll just hold up this device. Anyone know what this used to be? This used to be a Phantom Omni by Sensible. Um, and Sensible used to be another company. <laughs> they got bought out last weekend. So um, this is Geo something? Geomagic. Geo -magic. They didn't exactly buy them. They bought their intellectual property. Oh, I see. So it's a little confusing. What's yes. Are they still making I think so. <laughs> so this is a three active degree of freedom haptic device, so it gives you X, Y, and Z. And then it, it senses an additional three DOF on the gimbal. And uh, it's all cable drives. And so I had drawn a lot of these for you in the last lecture, but I thought it would be helpful for you to actually see, see a live one. So it's not the best setup in the world, and you're all welcome to come after class. But you see that little silver thing rotating? So you see the shiny part of the threads? Those are the grooves without the cable. And see in the bottom part, the grooves there? And see the cable coming off of it? Can you turn the lights off? Uh, sure. Can you get the lights, please, Alex? Awesome. Hey, that's perfect. So someone tell me the ang what the angle is called for the grooves. Helical angle or lead angle. And then somebody tell me what the angle is that that uh, cable is unwrapping from the capstan. The fleet angle. The fleet angle. And in this case, are they equal? Pretty much, because they, they designed this properly. So you're free to come and play after class. Notice real quick, you see how that cable is going up and down the, the capstan? What's that called? Cable walk. OK. So. Um, Let's talk about cable terminations. Do you want the lights on or off for this? Off? On? Does, does it matter? OK. Rob, can you see this OK with the lights off? OK. I can't see actually. Can someone turn on the lights? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for one of you to, to say yes for my sake. OK. So um, there are a couple ways to do this. You have two ends to the cable. One of them can be uh, pretty simple. So um, typically the way you'll do this, if we zoom in, I'm going to zoom in right here, is you'll actually have, instead, you'll put a little groove here, like this. And then your cable will actually come inside like that. And so one way that this might be done is, um, Maybe your cable will wrap down and fit into some type of notch that you've cut. There are many, 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 many ways of doing this. Or you could put some type of a clamp that bolts here, obviously not through the cable. There are like a billion different ways of doing this. I mean, it's not too complicated. Basically, there's a ball. This is thinner. You restrain the ball so it doesn't move. This is just for side, let's call it side one and side two. Everybody see this? And this doesn't have a ball. Remember, I showed you the different types of cramps. We can have cylindrical cramps. We can have cylindrical cramps with a rounded edge. So this is pretty flexible. This is easy. Uh huh. You don't want to drag your cable around any sharp corners. You draw a sharp one because it'll 
Sure. Stress it and cut or break. Thank you. That was actually my, my next question, which is why is this curved? He just answered it. Yeah, for that. Because <laughs> of what he said. Um, remember, uh, so if this is a sharp corner, it'll cut it. Okay? Well, so why did we, why did we pick uh, this particular radius? It's usually you want to do the minimum bend radius recommended for that cable. Now, you're not going to be wrapping and unwrapping here. This is just going around once. Um, and then it's not moving. You're just tightening it there. But if you have to pick a number for some reason between razor's edge and not razor's edge, I typically just go with the minimum bend radius and keep it the same for the entire pulley. So this is the easy one. This is just, and if, uh, this is just you know, restraining that ball right there. Now, the second one is always the hard one. Because um, in a system like this, the termination is also going to double as our tensioning system, typically. Remember, this gap in between the two pulleys is important to get that right. We don't want it too big, or else we have uh, lo vertical loading between the shafts. Um, and we don't want it too small, because uh, then it will crunch the cable. So it needs to be just right. We're not moving the shafts or anything. Which means, uh, and this is curved, so we're not going to put a turnbuckle like I showed you for the linear systems. So we need to restrain this and move it simultaneously. So um, let me show you. Let's see if I can actually get this up. OK. Can you see this with the lights off or on? So I'm not going to go into the whole mechanism, and I've intentionally hidden some of it. But you see this big wheel here? So that's the big wheel we're trying to drive, and this is the little shaft, the little, the little capstan. And this cable here is the cable in between uh, the, the two capstans. Now let me zoom in on that assembly and show you what's going on. Okay. So, someone tell me what these gray, dark gray things are called. Why do I have them? keep the cable from coming off, but mainly it helps in assembly, not operation. And also, if there is any, sl if you overload the system and one side goes slack in operation, it keeps it from coming off the pulley. But practically, I've always used it mainly for just assemblability. So let's look at how this works. One side of my cable loops around this screw. Everybody see that? Then it goes through this little notch here, and it curves around, it starts here and curves around. Everybody see that? Now notice this is very smooth. There are no sharp corners anyway to get cut on. Then the cable wraps around the capstan surface in a helix. And then we enter through this groove. See this one right here? And then it comes into this little groove here. See that? Is this clear enough for everybody? Now what? notice that the flanges are allowing me to, to get pockets where the cable can't escape. That's one way of doing it. You can machine, you can machine depending on what the design is, the flanges as an integral part of the capstan. But something I do quite commonly is I machine um, a capstan without any flanges. Then I laser cut very thin steel flanges. Because then I get to do fun things like making this pocket right in here where the cable passes and simply can't escape. So again, that's talking to assemblability. Could you machine? This flange is an integral part of this as designed? No. There's absolutely no way because you would ha it's not a straight, it, like if we took an end mill right here, this is not a straight shot, right? It's, not a, it's a curved hole. So the only way to do this is make external flanges. So then let's look at this. The cable comes right here and passes through this, this little uh, nut here and terminates on the other side. And then this screw here moves this block back and forth. Um, so I'm going to draw this real quick just to make sure it's, it's very, very clear. So, and I'm going to draw sort of a linear version. So we've got a block here, and let's ground that, OK? And now this is my screw. Now I'll use a third color. This is a nut. Okay, now, there are no threads in this hole, and let's make that explicit. 
So this is a through hole. So when I spin this screw, the nut spins with it, and what happens with respect to this hole? Nothing. Okay? So there are no threads here. The screw, when I rotate the screw, it's just rotating place. The nut's keeping it from moving in, in the axial direction like this. Okay. Now, with a fourth color, we put my little part here. Can you see this brown or orange? Okay. Okay. And then last but not least, I'm running out of colors. We have the uh, cable itself. So we put a termination here. And then like that. So what happens is, when I rotate this screw about its axis, nothing happens here because we have a nut. And in fact, let's, uh, let's fill that in so it looks nice and solid. And I'll write that. That's nut. And then screw. This is a plate. This is the cable. Nope. This is the termination. And then uh, let's call this the, um, I'll call this the tensioning block. By the way, I'm partially colorblind, so any questions about colors, I refer to the eye doctor. I can tell those are different, by the way. Um, so what happens here is when we rotate one way, the nut moves that way, and it pulls this termination that way. So assume for a second that um, we just grounded that cable. We screw, uh, and by grounding this, I'm just saying, you know, hold it, hold it rigid against your mechanism for a sec, okay? I turn the screw. Nothing happens to this hole because this hole isn't threaded. Then this tensioning block moves up and pulls against this termination that way and stretches the cable. Everybody see that? We're stretching the cable and we're adding tension to it so we can drive a load. Now, why, why are we doing this? This is kind of complicated, right? Why don't I just remember how I showed you the turnbuckle terminations where you can literally put screw threads right on the end of the cable? So that looks like um, So maybe we'll put a nut here, and then that's the cable. Anybody remember why we don't want to do that? If that thing will need to go over the school, like, um, th like not the third part, but like, let's say you don't have enough space for it mm -hmm. on your cable, open space, uh -huh. it's never going to go across the round of The main reason for this is, remember, this isn't a single strand. This is made up of anywhere from 7 to 49 strands. And then, so, and they take the strands like this, a bunch of them, and then they twist them around each other. So it's like a, it's like yarn is a spiral. If you put it on a screw, you're rotating it, which means you're either crunching the fibers against each other and ruining the cable, or you're undoing the helix and still ruining the cable. Your point is different, and I didn't quite follow it, but the, the, the main purpose here is if you connect the, the screw directly to the cable, you, you unwind the cable. So what we're doing here is if this is a, this is a through hole, and um, I notched these. Anybody know why I notched these? This tensioning block? Because if my, if my cable weren't to go straight, if I needed to pull it that way or that way, it would rub on the edge of the hole and get severed. So I put a chamfer here, a deep chamfer, so that I can have, um, I can swing my cable at different angles and I don't sever it on the edge of the hole. Super important detail. Have severed cables in the past. Does so that group go all the way around or is it just at the hole itself? Just at the hole itself. In fact, so. Sure. So just to show the block real quick. So this is the threaded hole that the screw goes into. This is the hole that the cable goes into. And see that deep chamfer? So let's look through it. See the chamfer on both edges? 
So part of it is if I put a ball or a round nosed um, crimp on the other side, even though there's friction between the crimp and that chamfer, it'll still rotate pretty smoothly so that um, nothing happens in terms of jostling will, will wind up the cable. Uh, and, but mainly, that means um, either way I assemble that, front or back, the cable won't get severed on the, ed the sharp edge of the hole. And in a block like this, aluminum or steel, it is going to be razor sharp unless you chamfer it quite a bit. So you want to know how this works again? Sure. I'm hoping, so now that I've drawn that for you, let's go back to this and let's see if it makes more sense. So the cable comes in right here, okay? And it comes through this hole right here. Now this screw is embedded in the plate. This nut here is preventing the screw from moving. So we can rotate, see how I can rotate the screw? But it's not moving actually. It's locked in place but it's free to rotate. This plate here is right near the bottom of the plate. So it's not able to rotate. It can only translate. Maybe that's what's confusing you that I didn't. So let give me one sec. Let's uh, let's show that as a prismatic joint, so you know that can't rotate. Um. Oh yeah, this is reversed from that drawing, but this can work either way. So. Uh, let me back up for a sec. You can use this screw mechanism. If, if the block moves this way, you're yanking on the cable that way. So if your load's over here, you're tensioning in this direction. Or you can reverse it. You can put the termination here and draw the cable up here going out, in which case it... But you can never move the screw upward, right? Like you can only move the screw in the same, uh, in the opposite direction as the tension that you're using. No, you can. It, the question is, is your screw going to be in tension or compression? Typically you want to use screws in tension, um, but you can reverse them and use them in compression. When you Basically you have to spec the strength of the cable versus the strength of the screw and you're always going to have a stronger screw, so it's fine. The nut is free to slide back and forth. Um, so, so let me demonstrate it this way. By the way, I expected lots of questions because this is... This is the hardest part of cables, and um, until you build it, which you will be building in lab three, it's a little bit tough. Okay, this is my tensioning nut. I'm going to place it on a flat surface. Now I have a screw right here. So the screw is keeping it from moving that way, right? And the screw is saying whether it moves this way or not. Now if I didn't have this flat plate, if I just had it in air and I spun the screw, what would happen? the entire thing would, would, would uh, just spin in place and it wouldn't move forward or back. But when I put it down against this flat plate, and now I screw, it goes back and forth like this. Okay? So... Is it the nut or the, the tensioning block? The tensioning block. So the, the tensioning block is threaded? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. is, is your screw threaded? Yes. <laughs> so there, there are lots of nuts and holes and screws and threads here. Let me draw helix, uh, helices on anything that's threaded. Okay, so the purple is threaded like this. So that means the tensioning block is threaded or not threaded? The tensioning block is threaded. Is this hole threaded? Okay, is this hole threaded? Okay, so this is the grounding plate. All it does is keep the screw from moving. The only thing the nut is doing is keeping the screw from wiggling axially, okay? The screw is able to, to spin in place freely. This tensioning block is threaded, so when the screw rotates, the tensioning block will either rotate or translate depending on how we've constrained it. Now, this is a little symbol for prismatic joint, just to show by placing it on a flat surface on the back, it's not free to rotate, so it's forced to translate, okay? And now, I believe Samir asked, uh, and Anand as well, um, why have I drawn the cable this way? Don't I have it reversed? For the CAD, it's reversed. So the um, termination's here, and the cable goes out this way. Okay? So that means if my cable comes in this way and I want to tension it, which way does this block move? This way? Okay. Now, say instead 
I don't want to do that. Say I want my cable terminated here and to go out that way for some other purpose. Now which way does the tensioning block move? The other way. Okay. Now, if I have the cable terminated here and going that way, and then I tension it, is the screw in tension or compression? Tension, which is good or bad? Good. The tensile strength for uh, just about every material is way higher in tension than it is in compression. So now, in this case, if I have the termination here and coming out that way, then uh, what loading is my screw in? Compression and flexure. If I'm, it would only be in pure compression if I was pulling directly along the axis of the screw. But I'm pulling offset from the axis, which means I'm trying to bend the screw that way. So I have two questions to follow up on that. Uh, what is, does the thickness of your tensioning block matter? Because you don't want the whole block to bend as you tension. Yeah, it really matters. Okay, and what's the distance between that nut and the tensioning block? The distance between you this? Yeah. Um, because you want to be, you don't want it to like, you know, run up against the nut or like. Fall. So there are a couple things that are very important. This is typically stainless steel. It's very stiff. So if you want to add, um, you know, a preload of 50 pounds, you actually don't have to give it much deflection at all. So then, should we have like one millimeter of, of travel? Would that be a good idea? Because we have to assemble this thing. We have to be able, the distance, say you have flanges you can't take off. The distance to get the cable over all of the flanges and then be able to take out that distance and tension it is way more than the distance that you need just to tension it based on the elastic modulus of stainless steel. So the first thing you have to worry about in terms of distances is um, length to get past flanges. Now remember when we were talking about belt, the simple, the simplest yet unacceptable way of tensioning a belt is what? Measure it, Just measure it perfectly and put it on. So that means if you have one, one pulley and the second pulley and you measure the pitch length around it, that that's exactly what you order and you just stuff it on there, okay? Now what happens if I put gigantic flanges on here, on both sides? Now how are you going to assemble it? You're not. So this is the issue, is even if your belts were perfect and your machining tolerances were perfect, which they're not, they never are, if you have flanges, you need a bigger belt to get it around the flanges just to install it. So then you start doing crazy stuff, which I've done, seen others do, which is terrible, which is you take the shaft out and you put the belt on and then you put the shaft through the pulley and the bearings but then that starts torquing your bearings and it's just bad, don't do it. So the key is both for belts and cables, you need enough length to be able to tension it but that's very little compared to the distance you need just to install and get past the flanges. Um, now there's another issue. Anybody know what it is? Belts come at fairly precise dis pitch lengths. I mean enough that you can order a 391 millimeter distance and you can order a 392 millimeter one. Do cables come like this, typically? No, they don't. You normally crimp it yourself. Now you can order it pre-crimped, but it's expensive and it's still not that precision, right? So basically, you're going to be crimping this thing probably half installed. It's not precise. So the second error is going to be uh, how accurate were you in crimping to the correct length when you were installing it. So crimp length accuracy. All of this is to say that cables are much harder than belts to install and tension and also it requires a lot more flexibility in the length of that cable which means for me I make this very generous. The separation here between the nut and the tensioning block. So I think, let's measure. Um, so this is, what you're looking at in SOLIDWORKS right now is the simplest type of cable mechanism you might ever do. Okay? And so I have, that's five, and then 20. So I have 26 millimeters of throw. That's a lot. 
That means I can screw up with the crimping, I can get it on the flanges, and still I can tension it. Yeah? So the way you have your CAD model here, your screw is in compression. Yes. Is that nut not scrubbing against the inside of the plate as you turn the screw? Uh, it is, yep. And it doesn't matter that that much. It's one of these things where you choose your battles. It's not that big of a deal. So let's draw it out. This is the this is the flat back plate that's constraining it. So that's this. And then this is the nominal position of the nut, right? So let's draw it. So this is the screw and it's threaded. Then this is where the cable termination comes in my CAD. So when I try to screw the block, what's gonna happen? It's gonna try to turn. Okay? But not very much. You just need, I don't know, ten thousands of clearance just to so it's not gonna so it's able to move freely. That's very little rotation. It works great. You are you are scrubbing at this contact line there, but um, it's practically it's not a big deal. Uh-huh. One of you? Yep. Uh, can you not thread the whole thing first and then crimp it so that your error is very little? You still have error, but I mean but not too much. Do you know what I mean? Mm -mm. Like for belts, it's already looped. But for cables, it's open-ended. Mm -hmm. You're basically tying it to the end. Yep. So you can get over the flanges and do all of that and then cut the cable. Yeah, you can do that. Part of the reason why it's hard is sometimes, depending on your design, your life is a lot easier if you install the cable and then crimp it. Sometimes you can get away with crimping it and then installing it. That's the better design, right? And then you can be more precise in your crimping. However, if we start out with a crimp that's shaped like this, and this is the hole, what happens when I squish this? It grows. I'm squishing it. So any distance I thought I had is now gone in terms of precision. It's, it, there's just no reason. If you, we, when you have a choice between requiring a high precision thing and a low precision thing, go with the low precision because it, it will be cheaper and a lot easier and more flexible. Yeah. I hesitate, but can you comment on the pros and cons of, let's say you just drill a hole in your fluid, put a screw in there, wrap your cable around it, and squish it down the uh, Okay, so let's see. We're going to drill a hole in the plate. Uh, yeah, radio. Okay. Yep. And now I'm going to have it come out of here and then wrap around. And then. Uh, no. So, so you've got this little screw sticking out. Uh huh. And, um, and you've got two washers in there, actually. You bring your cable in. Yep. Like an electrical connection. Uh huh. Put it around. Uh huh. Uh, actually, kind of clockwise. Okay, uh, clockwise. And now when you tighten the screw down, it's just going to squish it. Yeah, sure. So uh, I, think for, I think I understand Ken's description. So. Okay, we'll, we'll go to that too. So let's start out with, with Annie's suggestion, which is we have a screw, and they actually do sell these. I don't remember what they're called, but um, there's a hole all the way through the head of the screw, okay? And then the, the little hex thing is right here. So now we pass our cable directly through that. That's different, keep going. Um, th this is the simple idea, and then we'll get to yours. What do you think is gonna happen at the interface between the cable and the hole? A, it's sharp, and then uh, when you chamfer a hole on a flat plate, it works really well, right? Have any of you chamfered something on a, on a circular surface? It doesn't work so well. Very difficult. Also, screws are very hard material. You're not going to chamfer this to get rid of the sharp edge. Secondly, even if you do chamfer it, the screw head is almost always going to be way smaller than the minimum bend radius, so you're going to be wanting to break your cable. So that was Annie's idea. They do sell these. I don't suggest doing this. Um, now Ken's idea is to, I think, put um, a wa wow, that's not a circle. Uh, a washer here, and then a second washer like that. Okay, and then we're going to take the cable now in red and do that. And then when we clamp this down. And we'll keep going. When we clamp this down, 
um, the cable squished, right? And then when we keep rotating the screw, then it starts winding around. Um, that does work, and I've done it. Uh, I try not to clamp the cable, I try not to rely on clamping the cable too much because um, at least when I do it, I've ended up crushing the cable. And then right here, it ends up getting frayed, at least when I've done it. Now, you could be more careful about it and not fray it. It's, st it's still really hard on the cable. It's okay for prototyping it. Yeah. The other issue is, somebody tell me about these washers. Let me zoom in, let me zoom in here for you. So, no? Let's zoom in. So here's one washer, and here's the second washer. And then let's draw this as a circle. So that's the cable coming off. Does this look good? Everything's fine? Okay. So now let's draw the cable down by just a slight degree. And now I have a, a potentially very small bend radius and sharp radius on the washer. So now you're going to chamfer the, inside, the entire side of the washer. So in cables, you have to plan for things not being quite aligned properly. And then any edge that is small that the cable comes into contact with will just act like a knife and sever that cable. So like we've talked about one, two, three uh, different ways of terminating and tensioning a cable just like this. And uh, there are billions more. And it's one of these things where uh, you're only going to discover through trial and error which ones break and which ones don't. Can, you use Can I just what? Delville washers. Delville washers? Yeah. But then those aren't. Uh. Okay, I guess here's my question. And this is something that comes up a lot. You think going in, this looks like a pain in the butt, right? This is complicated, I have to machine things. Why don't instead, I'll just buy two washers and a screw and I'm done. And it's way quicker and then I'll be done. The difference is that you do this, you put in the overhead time here and you never fix it. Instead, you spend five minutes doing this and your robot breaks every other week, but it's already assembled so then you have to disassemble it and fix it. And so in aggregate, you have more time and more headache, plus you don't know when it's going to break. It's probably going to wait until the night before your deadline. So again, with most of the things in mechanical design, I started out at Stanford doing things cheap and dirty like the screw trick. And it just got too frustrating where I was fixing things constantly. So then I started looking for ways that it wouldn't break. So now it takes me longer to design robots than when I first got here, but my robots tend not to break. So that's why I recommend stuff like this with little details where notches so nothing frays even if it's at a weird angle. Um, and going back to the compression of the screw versus tension, um, in this CAD, this is an M6 screw. That's a giant freaking screw. Even compression and flexure on that screw for the working load of a small cable just is negligible. It just doesn't matter. Um, anybody tell me why I have this curve here? Theoretically, if everything aligns properly, the cable comes directly down to this hole and never even gets near that by about half a millimeter. But, just in case it does, I don't want it to rip the cable. Not only during operation, but also during installation. Say everything's slack and I'm just installing it, and this is a sharp corner. Say I gave it five millimeters of, of berth from the cable. I will never in a million years touch it. But, when I'm assembling it, um, I'm using pliers to tension this and my pliers touch the cable against that sharp corner and kink my cable and now my cable is useless. Half of designing for cables or three quarters maybe is assemblability. Can you put the damn thing together? Can you put it together by yourself with only two hands? Um, a recent colleague of ours in the lab Cedric Schwab is an amazing mechanical designer and he uh, built a, a six degree of freedom haptic device, all cables, very complicated cables, makes my cable stuff look like child's play. Um, it was awesome design, but just inherent in its complexity, it required like five hands to assemble it or two hands and like 10 jigs. So you have to think about how am I putting this thing together? Things like you know, do I have enough throw between the nut and the tensioning block to allow for imprecision in the, in the crimp length and also to just getting it past the flanges? Are there any other questions about how this works? Is everybody clear on how this tensions it? For simple stuff like what I showed you in this CAD, this is the way to do it. 
this will not lead you astray. Uh -huh. Does what the cable, like, I guess, come into contact with? Does it have to be metal, like plastic? Or so, so um, one thing you want to keep in mind <coughs> is remember cables, uh, the interface between. So, here, what is this cable relying on to attach to the big uh, capstan? What type of force? It's rigidly connected, right? I've bolted the terminations on. It's just bolted on. What force is it relying on to, for this little cap stand? Friction, okay? So if I made this out of Teflon, that would probably be a bad material selection, right? Because it would just, there's just no reason to slip off. Practically, everybody makes these, the, the little guys out of aluminum because it's cheap and it's easy to machine grooves into and it the aluminum steel has a pretty high coefficient of friction, higher than steel on steel, I believe. So you, you wouldn't want that out of a, a low friction material. Also, if it's soft, the cable, these are small diameters, it'll just start eating its way, pizza cuttering its way into the side. So that's why you also probably want metal. Now, for this big one, I have laser cut the big one out of Delrin, out of plywood. Plywood, after a few years, it starts to kind of etch its way in, but I've used Delrin for some time. That's the, the nice plastic and it works great. So, you know, on the order of Delrin and above. Everybody got this. This is key. This is lab three. So if you don't have it, let me know. Okay. Great. And remember, um, and I'll go over this in lab three, I want you to put the CAD in your solid works of the cable helix, not only as a curve, but as a solid model, just to make sure everything's good in terms of cable walk and clearances. So, remember last time, we're just about done with cables, remember last time, wow, it's almost five. Remember last time I talked about closed cable circuits versus um, not? So, Going back here, if I had one wheel and then a second wheel, and then I could terminate a cable and have it go around here. Remember I said we could either close this on the bottom and spin a motor here, or I could have two motors and yank on both together. And we were talking about the null space and how you could tension something that way. I decided to show you a different example. This is a little thing. Some of you might recognize this. This is sort of a puppeteering mechanism, you know, like Geppetto. And so I've got, can everyone see this? And Rob, can you zoom in? We've got uh, three wires here, okay? And by adjusting the angle of the thing in my hand, I adjust the angle of this. So it's limited rotation, but you can see I can go down and I can do this. So it's sort of a intersecting two revolute joints. This is kind of an eyeball mechanism. See, you can see this. Now I'm looking down. Now I'm looking that way. Now I'm crossing my eyes potentially. And I can't spin. So anyway, uh, this is a reason why you can imagine putting three motors here. And then um, if, I re if I coordinate the reeling in and unreeling of the cable, then I could get this motion. What's that Puppets. Oh. Literally. <laughs> like, if... And if I would like this, I could pretend it was Pinocchio. And Cables are easy! Whoop. Um. <laughs> this is quite common. Yeah, it's, it's quite common. What do you mean, Fleef? I mean, if you're like, you know, whatever, you control the puppet, but, you know, human, then it's the haptics whatever. Yeah. I mean, all you need to do to each of these, each of these cables is you attach a motor and then it yanks on the motor and then you've got encoders so you make sure that none of these is going slack. That's all it is. Okay, so we're done with cables. But remember, I told you that cables and belts are just special. That, think of it as an abstraction. The cable is like the closest to the abstraction. It's a loop and it acts on some type of friction to connect spinning shafts. And I promised you that there are other things. So I'm just going to show you real quick other things. What's this? 
It's a chain. This is what we'll be beating you with for being late for lab two. <laughs> so this is a bike chain. And um, this is a cable drive, right? Because I can, I can connect these, and then I can put two wheels in between. So this is a, cable, a type of cable drive, although not a cable drive. Don't call it a cable drive. What was that noise? Cell phone? Or video? OK. Just making sure our video didn't just die on the battery. OK, so uh, we, we spin both of these, and this moves great. Anyone tell me why I hate these? Huh? Different angles with those. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can twist it a little bit. Not much, but it's a safety thing. If I have a belt to do the same job as this, and I get my finger caught in it, which do you think is going to leave my finger somewhat loosely attached? The belt is going to crush. The bike chain is going to sever. So I prefer not to engineer with a bucket of ice next to me. Um, this relates to something else. Where do you see these? Bikes and scooters. I'm not joking. So if any of you are building mobile robots, which I'm hoping some of you will, and they're going to drive around, you need big honking motors. There's no reason to use a big honking Maxon to do that. That's overkill. You're probably going to end up buying like a scooter motor, which I conveniently have located here. I have three of them. So um, I'll show you that. OK, everybody see this? So this is something I'll explain another time what this is. See these motors? These are scooter motors, and let's zoom in a little bit. Can someone please turn off the lights for me? Awesome. OK, let's turn this where we can see it. OK, so this is a scooter motor. Each one of these was about 20 bucks. They're 200 watt scooter motors. Uh, if you want a 200 watt Maxon motor, good luck. And also, you need to do a mor second mortgage on your house. These are 20 bucks. Super strong, and you see they come with a with a um, a belt driver, a belt pulley already on it. They've done all of the engineering for you, so you just buy the corresponding belt and you're done. Um, can everyone see this? Okay, and just uh, to show you, see the the little brass thing that's rotating into the belt. What's that doing? Tensioning the belt. Sweet. So I know that's sort of a oh uh, a random thing to throw at you. Lights on, please. But um, just to show you real quick, because I think it's awesome. Uh, scooter motors are some of my favorite toys in the world. So go to electricscooterparts.com, and they sell every scooter motor you could ever want. They've got 24 volt all the way up to 60 volt motors. So let's look at this one. See how it comes with a belt pulley already attached? And now, the higher power ones, like the 48 volt ones, these are where you find the bike chain drives. So if you're building wheeled robots and they're going to be moving like serious mass, you may end up going with a scooter motor that has a bike chain drive. That's the only time I'd ever justify using it because they terrify me. Oh, what's the other reason? Anybody? Expensive. Nope. These are actually pretty cheap. They are really freaking noisy. So if you have a robot driving around people, you don't want it to be going the entire time. That's very obnoxious. OK, the next pseudo cable-like thing. Anyone recognize these from other than Mardi Gras? String of pearls. Uh, also, you see these as the things on um, windowsills sometimes that open and close the blinds. So. You could think of these little spheres as uh, teeth on a belt. And in fact, for your entertainment, I laser cut little pulleys that have a hemispherical uh, or a circular section teeth. And then when I spin this, it spins that. So how is this not a belt? It is a belt. It's a different type of belt. Um, Stock drive actually sells robotic versions of these that are precision. And Hanson Medical, anybody know them? Hanson Medical makes uh, a catheter for, robotic catheter for doing 
ablation inside your heart to treat atrial fibrillation, they uh, use stock drives, well, some manufacturer's version of stock drives ball chain. Why was it? I don't know. I'm not sure. I know they had, they had some quality control issues getting them precise enough. You can bend it out of plane. You have one plane and then you can go another direction. Okay. But, so, you can do that with cables too. Do you know why they, why they picked the ball chain over the cable? My guess is it has something to do with uh, mass producing things. Things are different between building one-off prototypes for your dissertation and then selling thousands of them that have to have zero downtime. Okay, so we've talked about gears, belts, and cables. Those are the three typical standard type actuators. Sorry, uh, mechanical transmissions. What happens if you just have a weird geometry where you need one shaft here and another shaft here and there's no clean way to connect them with gears, belts, and uh, pulleys, cables? Or maybe you're inside the human body and you need little robotic hands to do surgery like the intuitive da Vinci and you don't have the space for it. What if you do have the space, but and you can do the, the typical solution, but it's just so complicated and expensive that it's just a pain in the butt? Then we have some unusual type transmissions. Now, there, there are many more unusual transmissions than there are typical standard transmissions. I'm going to show you the ones I've personally used and enjoy. Um, so just a, a few of them, push-pull cables, flexible shafts, universal joints, pneumatics and hydraulics, and no, I'm not using these in the ways that you're familiar with standard, so don't think I mean actual pneumatics and hydraulics. Let's talk about push-pull cables. Somebody tell me what this is. Anybody? Rob, can you zoom in, please? This is a bike brake. And many grad students here could stand to get a set of these. <laughs> so I pull on this, and it yanks on a cable, and then that cable yanks on this. So this isn't push-pull. This is just pull, but... Um, what I want to show you is that this black part is a sheath, and then we have an inner core of a cable. Uh, I don't believe this is the hydraulic version. So bike cables, you can get hydraulic ones, and you can also get steel cable ones. The cheap ones are the steel cable ones. Now, uh, yeah, they've got some type of linkage here. We'll, we'll draw that out in a sec. So the the two main parts of our um, push-pull cable. Anyone tell me what the two parts of a push-pull cable system are? I'm not going to beat you with that bike chain for getting it wrong. Let's try. Two. Huh? Cable and, cable and sheath. Excellent. Okay. So this is our sheath. Okay. And then this is our cable. Okay, so basically the way that a push-pull system works is you ground both ends of the sheath and then when I push and pull this inner core back and forth over here, it pushes and pulls the end over here. Everybody see that? So, um... You'll notice, well, maybe you won't because that's not dissected. I'll show you on the camera in just a sec. Does this make intuitive sense to everybody? Think about this as just a rigid cylinder for a sec. If I ground the entire sheath and I push this, it moves, right? Now, if this is a flexible tube, I ground both ends so they're not moving. I pull, pull and push this and it moves. Everybody see that? Okay. Now, someone tell me something obvious about this picture. Very, well, very good. The cable is smaller than the sheath. This little gap here is critical. This is a sliding contact, right? We can't have sliding contact if there's no space in between the two things that are sliding against each other. So what does that sliding mean in terms of uh, moving this, let's call this the input, and this is the output. And what does that little gap here mean for the relationship between the two? 
I'm looking for two syllables. Backlash. This has backlash. It's not the, the standard thing you might think of it in terms of like gear teeth, but there's a clearance that's necessary for its operation. And what can happen is um, I push here, and instead of it transmitting this actually out, it just moves the entire curve up here. Okay? So basically, backlash is lost motion. We're moving the input, but nothing's happening on the output. And so the wiggling of that uh, inner core against the inner of the sheath is backlash. And you just can't get rid of it. Now, um, can't you, this is essentially a buckling. So if you need the cross sectional area and the forces, could it's actually it's actually not essentially buckling. But uh, we're going to come back to that in just a sec. You guys are always always champing at the bit for my next point. It's good. I'm glad. Um, so, I. S uh, that sort of defeats the purpose. Let's say this, now I've got two versions of this. I've got, um, I could make this inner core rigid, or, or not rigid, but um, capable of, here, let me just take, let me take, where did it go? Let me take this. Let's look at this as a, as a push-pull cable for a sec, okay? So I can push on this, and I can pull on it. So if I put a sheath around it, I guess my hand is the sheath, I can push and I can pull. Great. Okay. Now let's take this electrical cable and I'm going to put this in a sheath and I can't push on it anymore. That's why we have a sheath. Okay. For a push-pull actuator, you don't have to have um, a core that you could take away from the sheath and you can still push on it. You could literally take a spaghetti noodle that has been cooked, more or less, half cooked, al dente, and you could put it in a sheath and it would still push-pull. So you guys know Mark Kokowski's lab? And you know Song, uh, Song Bae Kim, who did Sticky Bot, the little gecko that climbs? He had this ingenious push-pull cable system where he didn't have a, a, like, a solid core, he had braided steel cable, like for a cable drive. And he, so, you know, you can't push on the cable, it's just like this. But when he put it in the sheath, it had really nice properties. So again, this doesn't have to be solid. This could even be braided steel cable. But let's talk about material for a second. So this is sliding contact, right? Which means we're introducing what? Friction. Is that good? I don't think that's good. Because if we have enough friction, I'm just not going to be able to push the cable. Or I'm going to have so much force trying to push on this Who said it? What's the word? You said it a minute ago. Buckling. So I'm going to push on this. And I got all this friction in here. And what's going to happen is it's just going to go It's just going to buckle. So if this were not a cord, if this were somewhat of a rigid core, and it goes that's buckling. Um, are you done with that soda can? Okay. Let's look at buckling. So this is a fairly solid object, right? Okay. So I was going to talk about this in a minute, but let's talk about it now. There are some fundamental types of loading. There is tensile loading. That's where I take this can and I pull both parts apart. There is compressive. That's where I try to crush it by like this with internal forces. There is shearing. That's where I take my hands and I try to move them like this. Or if I took, if I took, ah, this is good. Can everyone see the legs on this table? If I were to take the top of this table and push that way, see how it's trying to rip in half? It's trying to shear. Or I could take this can and I could apply moments and uh, maybe it would be better to look at this. If I twist <clears throat> like that, that's flexural loading. Then flexural loading, um, that is composed of both uh, tension and compression. 
So let's take this can and assume for a second that this can is actually this cable, okay? So I'm going to push, push, pull. <clears throat> Empty. I'm going to push, pull, okay? So which one of these loadings is it? It's compression. Okay, great. So materials have a compressive strength. They have a shear strength. They have a tensile strength. Flexural is a combination of the two. When something fails, it will fail in one of these modes. The compressive strength, I'm never going to get to for this. Anyone know why? It's going to buckle. Buckling is a geometrical phenomenon. I mean, it's also a material phenomenon. So the fact that I take this can, and hopefully I will not pull Gallagher on you. Mainly I don't want to have a heart attack, okay? So this is made of aluminum, and I guarantee you that the little force I used to crush that can was not enough to overcome the compressive strength of the aluminum material. Aluminum is pretty stout. What just happened to this can? It buckled because the geometry could not sustain it. Buckling happens before the material gives way in compression. So let's write the equation down. Some of you are MEs. I'm sure you had this in undergrad. Some of you are not, which is why I'm going over it real quick. Um, and let's erase some stuff. Okay, if I have a beam... and I support it on bo uh, both ends. Anyone know what these triangles mean? These are pivot points. It means it can rotate but not move. Okay? The force F, it's called the critical, the critical force, is pi square EI over KL quantity square, okay? This is the buckling equation. So FC is how much force it's going to take to buckle this bar. Pi is obvious. In the state of Florida, it's 3. You think I'm joking. Look up. They tried to uh, officially make pi 3 so students would do better in math. <laughs> e is Young's modulus. E is Young's modulus. I'm from Florida. E is Young's modulus. It's a material parameter. It's the stiffness. I is the, uh, air, the um, moment of inertia for area. So basically, we take a cross section here, we look at it, and we ca ca calculate the um, moment, uh, second moment of inertia there. L is what? Anybody? L is the length here, the free length. And then K is a special number uh, anywhere from, I don't know, from like 0.5 to 2, which basically talks about what these um, endpoints are. So for pivots, K is 1. And then if you, instead, you take the pivot and you ground it or do random things, it changes K. So basically it's a, it's a application-specific multiplier here. So what I'm trying to tell you is you have a push-pull actuator. This is grounded, the sheath, and we're going to take the core and we're going to push on it. It's not going to fail in compression. It's going to fail by buckling. This is the buckling equation. Don't worry about K. Make it one for all intents and purposes. You've got some, you can see that as L increases, what happens to the amount of force required to buckle it? goes down. So that means that if I try to push just here, there's a much higher force required to buckle it than if I try to push here. This is why in push-pull systems you want to minimize this free length, L, you want to minimize. Very important. Yeah? Um, is buckling reversible? It depends on if you plastically deform it. Buckling happens very quickly. It's not like a, oh, it's a little bit of a buckle, a little bit more, and then it you know, smoothly progresses. Often, 
like with the can, is the can's not coming back. And there was no point in that stop where it would have come back. I mean, like a microsecond. So often buckling is not reversible simply because it happened so fast that you had catastrophic failure before you were able to stop. Now, what you can do, and if any of you have ever stuck a thin pin in a vise, is, uh, here, we'll try this. If I take this, see how that's bending out of, out of off axis? I mean, if you did that to a, a steel shaft just a tiny, tiny little bit, then yeah, you could come back. But typically, no. Don't plan for coming past buckling. Okay. So, uh, because to minimize friction, what I do for small robotic applications is I use a Teflon tubing. It comes from McMaster. It's really cheap. It works great. It's uh, neon orange, which is also a side benefit. Um, and I use a core of nitinol. Anyone know what nitinol is? It's a nickel titanium alloy. It's also that, yes. So let's, um, let's duplicate this on my screen. Okay, everyone see this? Can someone get the lights, please? So the neon orange thing is Teflon, very low friction. And the inner core is nitinol. Okay, see, very smooth action. Now none of you can see what my right hand is doing, but um, I have this at a 90 degree bend over a very tortuous path. What does tortuous mean? Winding. Okay, so you can, after class, you can play with this. It also means this class, doesn't it? <laughs> ah. <laughs> so, uh, this is uh, very low friction, very cheap materials. Now, anyone tell me why I'm using nitinol? Okay, so we get the lights, and I will tell you why I'm using nitinol. Nitinol has two very nice properties. Just to start off, nitinol is roughly half and half nickel and titanium, and. Um, there are two things about nitinol that make it ideal for a push-pull actuator transmission. One is it's called super elasticity. So what this means is if you look on a standard, uh, that's pretty light, isn't it? If you look on um, a stress-strain curve, you usually is something like that. What's this? That's it snapping in half. So this is the linear region. That means if you stress it, it'll come back more or less. This is the plastic region where it's actually going to come back somewhere else permanently deformed. Now what we have for, um, for nitinol in a certain crystal form is this region here. Can everyone see this? So for a given level of stress, what am I doing? Stretching. I'm stretching it. So my stress is low, I'm not breaking it, and yet I'm stretching it. Now it's not a flat curve, that'd be creepy, but um, let, me, let, me make, let me exaggerate it a little bit. Okay. So this is the super elastic region. So what this means is for fairly low stresses, I can take something that's super elastic and just bend the hell out of it. So this region down here is anywhere from 0.1 to 0.2% strain. And this super elastic region can go anywhere from 10 to 15% depending on the, the particular alloy and temperatures involved. That's a big number compared to 0.1 to 0.2. Did that to aluminum or steel and you'd have a broken piece in your hand. Uh, that's uh, strain as a percentage of the original length. So if originally it was 100 millimeters, now it would be 110 or 115. Remember, that's what they make um, expensive glass frames out of, so you can sit on and just frame that. Exactly. Thank you, Ken. Now that you mention that, don't, don't take that as a suggestion to go on vacation. Okay.
Is this on auto? Someone tell me if you can see this because I'm blind now. Yeah. That's my glasses. They're night and all. If you wear glasses, you would do well to get them so that you don't, uh, you know, sit on yourself. Okay, so the super elasticity is what allows us to get huge strains. And anyone know why that is so important for our push-pull cables? Because we're not going in a straight line. If we were going in a straight line, it'd be no problem. But we're not. We're going in a very torturous curved path. And it's kind of like the torturous path I'm walking as I search for the night and all I misplaced. Here it is. Okay. So let's go back over here. Everyone? Ah. One day we're going to have the nice uh, setup. Can everyone see my hands? I take this and I bend it and I twist. You cannot do that with aluminum or steel. Try it sometime. If this were a paper clip, it'd be broken. This is super elasticity at its finest. So let's see that. See how curved that is? That's pretty ridiculously curved. If that were aluminum or steel, we'd be dead. So super elasticity is one thing. Great. So how are we going to attach the end of our core to whatever it is we're pushing or pulling? So we said we're grounding both of these. Let me actually draw it slightly differently to give you a better idea of it. So let's do a 90 degree bend. Okay, we ground here, we ground here, and our core comes out this way and comes out this way. How should I attach this to something? Let's say, I don't know, I have a block. Let's say I have a block here and I'm in the block moving business and I would like to attach this to that block. Any ideas? Same way you would uh, terminate a cable? We can actually do a little simpler. So let's take a screw head and clamp it down and we can use a washer and th you'll see where I'm going with this for a second. You, if you're doing braided cable, you can't do this because of the same reasons we discussed, it'll sever it. For night and all, this works just beautifully. Now let's look at a top view. If this is the washer and the screw, and this is the cable, is this, is, is this the best configuration we could do for clamping down on the night and all? Instead, I could twist it around, right? Well, that night and all is pretty bendy stuff. So if we twist it around, we'll, we'll evenly load it more and then we won't crush that core as easily. This is pretty twisty stuff. It's really hard to bend it around a little screw. So what's the second property of night and all that I might want to use? Shape memory. Night and all is an SMA. Shape memory alloy. So what this means, like all metals, nitinol has a crystal structure. However, nitinol can very easily shift between two different crystal structures, which changes the macrostructure of the material. So basically there's a temperature, and if you uh, go through that temperature, you see a change in crystal structure from austenitic, that's austenitite, to martensitic, or martensite. And that has a corresponding change in the macrostructure of the geometry. Now, um, if you really want to learn about this, I refer you to nightnall.com or Wikipedia or Ellis. <laughs> um, but just to give you uh, the quick thing, if I were to take a piece of nightnall like this and then bend like this, which is what I'd like to do to wrap it around the screw head, and then heat the living crap out of it, and then let it cool, 
you'd be locked in this shape. It's called training. And then I leave it, and we're good. Now the next time that I heat it, it's going to go back to the original shape. It's got memory. That's why it's called shape memory. Um, now, nitinol is called... Nitinol exhibits extrinsic two-way memory. And I'm going to talk about this more another day. Okay, what this means is I can actually have a, a slightly different shape. Say I just, say I want to go between slightly bent and really bent. So this is the wire that I just get from McMaster. And then I train it for, let's call it A and B. And you do this through a cycle of heating, cooling, and bending. As long as I have some restoring force that helps A go from B, then I can heat it and cool it and heat it and cool it and it will pop back and forth between shapes A and B. So have any of you, any of you have seen nitinol motors? Basically what it is, is it's just a string of nitinol. It started out about that long and then uh, when I heat it, it contracts. And then typically there's a little spring here that restores it back to the original length and then I heat it and it contracts and then I let it cool and it goes back to the original length because of this extrinsic spring. Nitinol doesn't go back to its old state without an extrinsic force. So what does all of this mean? It means I can take a chunk of nitinol, heat the living crap out of it, and it's going to stay in that nice shape. If you try to do this with pliers without heating it, it's not going to work at all. I've tried it. So let's review. Mm -hmm. Does it only go back to its original form or can you just turn it into something else? It, um, it, well, I could easily make B its original shape, right? So I could either have it go from A to B or just A to original. Oh, yeah. But basically it's one form to another and you can train both of those forms. The key is you have to have an extrinsic force trying to yank it into one of those states because it has hysteresis. Hysteresis meaning it's not perfectly going back to the deformation it started out from. So let's review. Oh, this is fun. Why does anyone care about this? I'm merely serious. Why does anyone care about this? Push-pull actuators, other than bikes. I know some of you care about this because I've seen you doing it for research. Medical devices. Exactly. So, especially for um, gastrointestinal stuff, they can't stick their hand up into your colon, at least not far. And so what they do is they send a colonoscope, aka an endoscope, and they send very long, thin, flexible instruments through the working channel of that endoscope. <coughs> okay, so this is outside and this is inside of you, deep. And when I push pull this, my little instrument moves. Now none of you can see this, so I'm going to put this under the microscope. Uh, and give me one sec. <coughs> um, okay, everyone see that? Give me one sec. It's a, little, it's a little tough. See that? Okay. Now, I recognize this is weird, but as every time I see this, it brings about something. This is what I think of. Here we go. You're anesthetized. So, <laughs> I personally, I personally find the idea, I personally find the idea, thank you Pagliacci, I personally find the idea 
of this doing anything near my body, especially internal, um, to be revolting. <laughs> and so it makes me into a sad clown. But uh, anyone know Pagliacci and Pavarotti? Okay. So this is super tiny. I'm using a microscope. And what this is, is just, there's a spike on the end. <laughs> It spikes you and cuts the material and then these little grippers with serrated teeth grab onto it and then they yank it back out of their working channel and they analyze it under microscopy. Now, I don't know if any of you can see, part of the lag here is that it's just low frame rate camera. But if you kind of watch, watch my hand and watch that, see how there's actually a pretty big lag? Why? There are a couple things that are going on. In a push-pull system, in a push-pull system, remember we have backlash, so we have to push through the backlash, and also this core has some stiffness, and there's high friction in here. Oh my God, it's so annoying. Um, there's some friction in here. So what happens is I start pushing this and it doesn't move because I haven't supplied sufficient uh, force to get past the stiction or the static friction here. Okay, so I'm compressing, compressing, and I'm building up enough force through the spring effect that finally I overcome the stiction and then it moves. And then it moves and takes up the backlash. And then after I've moved and it's taken up the backlash, then I see the output move. So when I press here, I'm pressing for quite a bit before I see this input ever move due to friction, and I'm going to call it S friction for static, and backlash. So there's a bit of a delay between your hand moving and that thing taking a sample of your colon. <coughs> Going back to Hansen Medical, they um, have catheters and they use uh, Ken, are they push-pull or just pull in the Hanson Medical catheters? Uh, uh, the actuation of the catheter is all pull-pull. All pull-pull? The, the working channel is push-pull like you described here. Okay. So, this static friction is nasty. Anyone tell me something simple about static versus kinetic friction coefficients? Static is higher. Static is higher. So, mu s greater than mu k. So, if I want to if I push too hard on this, what's going to happen? It's going to buckle. So I'd like to minimize the force I have to exert to overcome friction. So which one of these would I like to be working with? Kinetic or dynamic friction. So what can I do to this inner core to make sure that I've always got dynamic kinetic friction? Huh? Basically, I could just do this a little bit just to keep it moving. Now remember, I've got that axial compression and I've got that backlash. I can do this quite a bit and not move the output very much at all. And then finally, when I want to move, I start doing that. It's basically a sine wave on top of a carrier wave. So if this is, if this is the motion we want to achieve, we're actually doing this when we're riding along. This is called dithering. This is a very common control, control strategy. Or you could do a triangle. Rob is saying triangle. Dithering is use a triangular wave. Basically what you're doing is you're keeping it moving at all times so that it's always kinetic friction. And then you have lower forces and then you don't have to deal with the nonlinearities, uh, as much of the nonlinearities of the friction. And also you have lower force so that you're not buckling. Also, the, the same crimps that work for sh uh, be, uh, stranded cables work just well for night and all. Sure. So the exact same uh, minimum bend radius for braided cables works for night and all, but it's worse. Anyone know why? Go back to the ca to the cable construction we talked about. Remember the seven by forty nine. Nitinol is a solid core uh, fiber, not really fiber. It's just one single strand. The, for the same diameter, remember we take the steel cable 
and we fill it with lots of little strands, each of which is way more flexible and has a much smaller minimum bend radius than the single core. Nitinol gets nasty, even though it has super elasticity, gets nasty in terms of minimum bend radius. Look it up, respect it, otherwise it's going to kink, break, it's going to be bad. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. Uh-huh. Um, the bend radius, whether it's a tight bend or, or not so tight, um, affects the amount of pressure on the cable that you're sliding through it, so the wear rate is going to be higher if you try to go around the sharp corner. Secondly, I think even more important is the amount of uh, change in direction you make causes the delta tension to go up exponentially with the amount of radius that you go around it. So you want to be careful not to have any more bending of the cable than necessary. You don't want to try to you know, snake it all around Thanks. So, um, basically, if we have a straight section, the force required to move the output through the input is much lower than if we take this and do a curly cue. I can tie a knot. Everyone see I've tied a knot here? I can tie a knot and still move the input and the output, but it's way higher friction, way higher forces involved. Okay, let's go to another one. Has anyone seen a plumber snake to clear out a clogged drain? Okay, has anyone seen this, this being a flexible shaft for a Dremel? Okay, so let me just show you how this works. So, the Dremel motor's here, my cutting tool's here. So I'm transmitting that rotary motion and that power from between arbitrary positions and shaft angles. They do the exact same thing to unclog drains when they're really clogged. So we're not going to use Dremels for our robots, but we are going to use these. These are flexible shaft couplers. And you can get these on McMaster, you can also get them on stock drive, they're called different things. But basically the idea is I take a shaft at one axis, I put it somewhere else, and it rotates. Okay. Minimum bend radius, see how it, it wants to spring back? Respect these for minimum bend radius too. What this is, is it's a special sort of double winding with a core and it's pretty complicated how they make these things. It's very rigid in torsion. So when I rotate one and the other rotates. It's not rigid flexurally so I can bend it around. So low flexural rigidity, high torsional rigidity. A lot. So it depends on the diameter of it but like were I just to hold this in my hand it'd rip my fingers off. So, And I, I have um, here, why don't you guys pass these pass this around? Each of you can grab one. Only, only I need all of these prototypes back at the end of the day, please. So, what's the problem with this? Anybody? Input, output, this thing, and what's the problem? So, the drill is my input. This is my output. I want to precisely track the theta on the input to theta on the output. What's the problem? Huh? Okay, efficiency. efficiency, sure. Anything else? It's a spring. Everything in the universe is a spring. It might just be it's too stiff for you to really see it. Diamond is a spring. Steel is a spring. This wood is a spring. It's all about the relative stiffness of that spring. And there are axial springs in terms of every, everyone's seen a spring, right? So there are lots of different types of springs. We'll probably be talking about that next Monday. This is the axial type, but there are also torsional types. Being um, when I rotate this and I hold this fixed, it wants to spring back. It's called a, tor a torsional spring. The problem is that um, it's called wind up. For flexible shafts, that's the principal problem. There isn't backlash, but there is flexibility. And depending on what you're doing, that may be too much. So look at that. Also, these are rated for power. So what's that mean? If I am rotating very slowly, 
what happens to my torque compared to if I'm rotating very quickly. Say one last time. Well, if you're yeah. So if I'm doing this manually and not moving very much, my torque's huge. If I'm moving really quickly, my torque's low. When you spec these things out, they'll tell you the torque specifications for manually, like by hand, and then for some certain dynamic or you know high RPM. And the dynamic or high RPM is much lower torque. Okay, now. Um, you don't see these used too, too commonly, so I'm going to go ahead and show you some stuff to prove that someone has actually used these. Again, I need these back. These are, I wanted to give these to you in a lab, but um, they're like 60 bucks a pop, so we didn't really have money. Can someone get the lights, please? Okay. So this, is, this was my second project at Stanford as a PhD student. This is a 15 degree of freedom hand. It's five fingers, each finger has three joints, and you notice what transmission am I using? Those things. So each joint on these three finger hands is spun by one of these flexible joints. So I got 15 of them. And the reason being, you see there, I don't have a wrist. It's just a mesh of these things. It actually works pretty well. And um, that back drive here, it's multiplex. So there's only one powerful motor. And then I've got some, some smaller, I've got some mechanical widgetry that's basically sucking power off of that. So it's underactuated, but it's highly dexterous. That's beyond the point. I use these flexible couplers to get all the way, this is about two feet. And you see how this one is flexing through the joint? That's why this is nice because I can, I can flex through the wrist, up through the mechanism, and I can flex, and as long as I don't exceed that minimum or go below that minimum bend radius, nothing breaks. Whereas if I did that with belts, gears, and cables, it'd be a super pain in the ass. So just to show you, um, So this is just one finger. See how I'm bending that flexual shaft coupler all the way down? Uh, yep, those are worm gears. Okay, and you can see not everything's properly aligned, but it's still okay because I have a lot of uh, misalignment um, tolerance. And then let's. So um, I just wouldn't have been able to build this at all if I had used traditional power transmissions. So anyway, this is an application in which they're actually very well suited. Only one powerful one and then five much smaller ones. But at any, at any given time and direction, I had full control over 15 degrees of freedom. OK, let's talk about, oh man, I'm revealing my secrets to you. Okay, let's talk about another thing. Lights, please. And then... I know it's painful with the camera, but it's the only way I can show a bunch of you really tiny parts. Okay. Can everyone see this? Actually, lights off. Sorry. Whoever sits in the back corner gets put on an exercise diet for the entire course. There we go. Can you see that better? These are called universal joints. These are very useful widgets for um, turning uh, one shaft rotation into another shaft rotation at angles up to anywhere from zero to ninety. So. Just to show you real quick, what this is, is it's two pins. So, okay, let's back up for a sec. This one here is called single, a single universal um, joint. This one here is called what? Double. Double. 
Yes, it's two of them. That means you get twice the angular deviation between the two shafts. Sorry, this is Blair Witch style. Please, no one puke. So one shaft goes here, one shaft goes here, and then in between, I can rotate this way, and I can turn it the 90 degrees and rotate the other way. So now let me show you. Uh, Rob, can you come here for a sec, please? Okay, so two shafts, and just check that out. This is just how flexible it is. Go ahead. Okay. So this is straight, and then I can bend it in any direction. Now they're not, they're not torsionally compliant, which is necessary for it to transmit power. But I can do this, and now watch this. I can move in a circle all the way around this circle, see? And the double one can go twice as far. Thanks. Okay, so someone tell me No, just pitch and yaw. No roll. Roll is rigid. Do you know why roll is rigid? Because what? Roll is rigid because roll is what you're transmitting torque about. If roll were, were, were free to roll, we wouldn't transmit any torque. So, um, and can someone please turn on the lights? I, I should probably design like a remote. I apologize. Yes, clapper. That'd be awesome. Okay. So the, the way that this works is I've got two parts for shafts and then in the middle, this is sort of the origin and I've got two orthogonal uh, ang um, axes of revolution and I can rotate about both of them. Um, and basically what it is is So uh, let's take these axes and actually move them cleanly. So one axis is through there, through the slot, and the other axis is like this. And basically I have uh, pins in the middle that allow rotation. Does everyone understand how that works? It's a little confusing. Maybe if I use the microscope. I'm not sure. There are lots of different variations of this. You have, actually that's an excellent point, thank you. Um, there are spherical joints. Okay, let's back up. You don't have to have one axis for bearing. You could do a spherical joint. And depending on how they've done it, it will either be two or three axes. If it's two, it's yaw and pitch. If it's three, then it's yaw, pitch, and roll. A true spherical joint is yaw, pitch, and roll, right? There's a difference between something like on the end of a mop that allows the, the stick angle to be in, independent from the angle of the mop head. There's a difference between that and something that's designed to transmit power. Just because you see a spherical joint does not mean it's a universal joint. What distinguishes the universal joint is it's meant to transmit power. Most of the spherical joints that you see in everyday products are meant only to allow something else to rotate freely in three different axes. The universal joint is mint. It's a mechanical transmission. I, I'll show you. Um, I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you spherical bearings another day. They're really cool things, but uh, they're very different for universal joint. Okay, so everybody look at this. Okay, now you see how in the middle, here's one pin, 
And then as I rotate, here's another pin. So now let me rotate for you. So this, oh God, this is one degree of freedom. See that? And now I spin 90 degrees, and this is another degree of freedom. So as long as I don't come such that I collide with either of the ends, then I have basically a cone of motion, right? So let's, did everyone see those two pins? So let me spin this in the drill for you. So we, we start out straight, and this is pretty easy. And now I can go up this way. Bob, can you zoom in? I can go down, I can go up, I can go sideways. I can go anywhere around in this cone of motion. Let me show you. That kicking is me going too far and the, the, the two little yokes that hold the pins are colliding. So let me try a smaller cone. See that? So I get a cone of motion. Now these can transmit fairly high loads. But I told you guys that there were pins. Pins are not ball bearings. Pins are what type of contact? Sliding. Sliding contacts require what for them to operate properly? Space. space. And space leads to what in terms of motion? Backlash. Backlash. So, I have a pin and then I have a plate. There's a little gap here. That leads to backlash. This is an inherent thing of having pins. That's a cheap universal joint, by which I mean it's like 60 bucks. They have anti-backlash universal joints. They have a variety of ways of doing it, whether it be basically springs or whether it's I think stock drive sells some that are basically four spheres that contact, and they're called zero backlash. I've never used them. Um, well, part of it could be the space, right? The actual universal joint itself, this one's about two inches long, and I've got one over there that's about an inch long. They don't make these for small distances. They make these for big distances. Um, and they have a pretty uh, bad minimum radius for any amount of torque. So if you have shafts, say I had a shaft, if I drew this one to one, I had one shaft here and then I have to have the other shaft here, I just, I physically don't have room for it, right, while, while obeying my minimum radius. So my only solution is to put a universal joint there, just because of space. Also, I believe universal joints have higher torsional rigidity, so you won't get as much uh, wind up or springiness. Uh, oh, another point about these. The torsional rigidity of these is very dependent on the amount of bending that you're doing. Okay? So everybody take, does everyone have one of these by now? Go ahead and hold them in your hands as straight as you can and twist and feel how rigid that is. Now bend it into a curly cue. Please don't break it in half, but bend it into a curly cue as much as you can without breaking it and try twisting it again. And everyone hopefully will feel that the torsional stiffness just went down quite a bit. Can anyone confirm this? Corroborate? Okay, <laughs> so I designed and built a cheap seven degree of freedom arm with Morgan Quigley a few years ago. The roll of the, L of the wrist, remember we talked about roll pitch roll? The, uh, the last pitch roll was that friction differential with belts that we're doing for lab two. The roll, the first roll of the elbow was one of these. It came from the shoulder. Why? I put the motor in the shoulder to reduce inertia. It's, it's, it, it wasn't quite grounding, it was flying, but it was pretty, it was as, as close to the shoulder to reduce inertia as possible. Okay, so being inexperienced, I had something basically like this, and it worked great. And then I bent the arm like that, and suddenly it was real springy, and I had this low frequency resonance so that the arm kept going yoing, 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 yoing. You can't get rid of it. So when you're using these, make sure that you've spec to make sure that when you actually do bend it around the path you need, you still have the torsional rigidity. What they spec you in the spec sheet is not the torsional rigidity that you're going to get practically once you've abused it by putting it in a tortuous path.
All right, we got six more minutes. Let me see what else we got. All right, so just to recap real quick, if you have weird geometry and you want to transmit motion, or maybe it's not weird and you simply don't want the com mechanical complexity and cost of uh, using belts, cables, and pulleys, surely all of you can see that this flexible shaft here and this universal joint here and even the push-pull cable are way easier, way easier. So um, don't discount them just because they're unusual. They are awesome. I have used all of them extensively and it's reduced the complexity of my mechanical stuff from never going to work in a billion years to, hey, that worked pretty easily. Let's talk about springs for a sec. So, any, are there any questions about what we've talked about thus far? A any before we move on? Okay. Let's talk about springs. Here are my springs. There are many types of springs. Many, many, many. So, I think all of you, Rob, can you zoom in for me, please? I think all of you have seen most of these. This is a compression spring. Compression because I compress it. This is an extension spring or a tension spring because I pull on it, I apply tension. What's this one? This is a torsional spring. I take these two leaves and I ro rotate down in my hands. <coughs> Torsional springs suck. These things are razor sharp. They break free and lacerate you quite easily. Just so you know, they exist, but be careful with them. Those are the three main types of springs. Then we get into the billion minutia of different flavors of springs. Anyone ever replaced the battery on an electrical device and seen that there's a spring that's in the shape of a cone? It's a conical spring. It has interesting force deflection properties. What happens with a conical spring as you uh, deflect it and the coils start touching each other? Weirdness, that's what. You have to go from no contact to contact and it starts changing the stiffness. If you guys are interested in conical springs, I'm not going to go over them because I don't use them. You go to, I don't know, Google conical springs and they're really quite interesting. Magnets, are magnets a spring? Anybody? We're talking about springs and I just mentioned magnets, so the answer is yes. Magnets are an awesome spring and I'm just giving you an introduction to what we're talking about Monday. We'll, we'll talk more about springs on Monday. Magnets are a terrific, compact, highly power dense, nonlinear spring. These springs all obey Hooke's law, which is what? F equals KX, nice and linear. I seem to recall magnets operate on a cube to a third, maybe. Anyone corroborate? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, as the distance between them gets uh, smaller, it is um, ex uh, exponent to three instead of one. So anyone see my fingers? I cannot. I physically, I'm not strong enough to get these two itty bitty little magnets together. So if you don't have room for traditional spring, oh my god, I love magnets. I've used them repeatedly. Uh, next on Monday I'll show you a video I did for a class project and it was not working until I introduced a magnetic spring. Why also might we want a magnetic spring in terms of a robot? In stops. If you have um, basically your joint and you need to stop it from going past a certain angle, magnets are very powerful, very compact and they have a nice ramp up so that the contact starts out little and builds up gradually and it basically goes, uh, you know, for, for your purposes, it goes up to infinity in terms of it's not, for Big Bang, it's not going to touch the other end. It's a nice ramp. Anyway, that's the introduction to magnets. One last closing thing, just to give a plug for the awesomeness of Legos. These are Lego universal joints. That's sweet. So, this is one axis, this is the second axis. And you can see they're spinning, and that's just awesome. So again, all of you for Christmas, I'm sure you have 
brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews. Um, go ahead and buy them. Lego Mindstorms. <laughs> okay, we're done for today. Uh, lab 2 is out. Feel free to come by and ask questions. The SOLIDWORKS is due on Monday, and the prototype is due on Friday. And we are falling behind, so I probably won't be bumping those around. So those are hard deadlines. I need all of your flex shafts back, please. Those are expensive. Um, I was done with the SOLIDWORKS. Uh, when can I come by?